Okay, we're live. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the research Wikimedia Research Showcase for June uh, 2021. My name is Martin Gerlach. I'm a research scientist at uh, Wikimedia Foundation, and I welcome you to today's theme, which is around the topic of governance of AI and machine learning models. What does this mean? Well, there exists a variety of algorithmically powered models in Wikimedia projects to automate tasks and support editors and readers. For example, the ORES model is designed to help detect edits that are vandalism. We have various recommender systems uh, for article tr creation or article translation. Uh, and we also have um, tools for supporting editors, such as suggesting tasks or even suggesting specific edits. The Wikimedia Foundation now also has a dedicated team, a machine learning team, to support machine learning capabilities around this. So the use of these models is likely going to increase. However, the use of these technologies poses several really severe social technical challenges around the design, the use, and also the impact of these models. For example, we know that these algorithms can be biased and discriminating or have really un unintended consequences. So how can we make sure that these algorithms are equitable, such that they not only meet technical standards, but also ethical criteria. Uh, on the other hand, how can we make these models compatible with the values of Wiki Wikimedia around openness, transparency, and participation? For example, what is the underlying data? Can the models be inspected and evaluated or even changed and controlled by the users? And for this, I'm really excited that we have some tool great speakers today to give us, share their expertise, and hopefully we have a good discussion around this. Uh, first, we have Hai Zhu. She's an assistant professor of human-computer interaction at Carnegie Mellon University, and she will present on bridging AI and HCI, incorporating human values into the development of AI technologies. In the second half, we will have Andy Craze, who's a senior software engineer here at the uh, machine learning team at the Wikimedia Foundation. And he will talk about ongoing work around developing a framework for the governance of machine learning models. Um, before I pass it on, I just want to mention that after each talk, we have ample time, hopefully, for Q&A. Uh, so if you have questions for the speakers, please put them in the chat or on IRC. My colleague Isaac Johnson will monitor the channels and relay them here in the chat. And with this, I'll pass it on to, I'll stop talking and pass it on to Hai Yi. Thank you, Martin, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay, can people see my screen, see my slide? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Hai Yi Zhu. I am an assistant professor in HCI Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. It is my great pleasure to speak here. Today I'm going to talk about, sorry, I slightly like changed my title to how we can like incorporate community values into the development of AI technologies. AI technologies have changed how we connect, communicate, exchange, and work with each other. These technologies are in, impacting our groups, communities, organizations in important and complex ways. 
At the high level, I do research in human-computer interaction. I specifically study how the AI technologies and groups, communities, and organizations are co-evolving, transforming each other in the process, and how we can design better AI technologies to better support our groups, communities, and organizations. I conduct research in multiple domains. Uh, I work on AI-supported online content moderation in the context of, of the Wikipedia community. And in today's talk, I'm going to focus on some of our current uh, recent projects in this domain. And uh, in addition to work uh, to this work on Wikipedia context, I also work on mental health support communities. And people with mental health problems are increasingly turning to online peer support communities for help instead of professional services, because these peer support services is much cheaper and more accessible. I work with Seven Cups platforms, which is one of the largest online peer support platform in the world, to understand people's experience in this online peer support communities and design various uh, intelligent tools to uh, create a better peer support environment. I also work on AI supported child protection in collaboration with Allegheny County. For example, we have been working with Allegheny County to redesign the algorithmic screening tool to aid core screeners in making recommendations regarding further investigation. I also study Git work, Git platforms, and the whole gig economy ecosystems with the goal of designing AI tools to empower and enhance gig workers. Across all these domains, I, uh, my research or my, uh, my research trying to answer this question, how can we conduct community-centered AI design? Specifically, how can we better incorporate communities' values and goals into the design of AI systems and tools? So in today's talk, I'm going to talk about three projects in the context of the Wikipedia and Aura system. So first, I'm just going to give a very brief uh, introduction to the background of Aurus. I think the audience here are extremely familiar with Wikipedia. And then Aurus, which is the Objective Revision Evaluation System, is a quality prediction system which generates predictions on the quality of the edits. For example, they will predict whether this edit is a, a damaging edits, non-damaging edits, whether it's a good face edits or like uh, bad face edits. So uh, our system or these ORIS predictions have been incorporated uh, in the recent changes interface, uh, vandalism finding tools like Hago and more than 30 other applications. In today's talk, I'm going to talk about three uh, projects in the context of ORUS. First project is that we, uh, our team conducted interview studies to understand the Wikipedia community values for quality predictive systems like ORUS. This work was published at CHI 2020. Actually, I think my student Estelle gave this talk at some point uh, in the uh, research showcase last year. So, uh, so I'm just going to briefly highlight some of the main findings of this uh, first study. And then I'm going to talk about how we created a virilization system to capture and explain the trade-offs between the multiple community values and goals that are uh, identified in the first interview study. And this work was, uh, is going to appear at this 2021. And next, I'm going to give a brief overview of the current, our current ongoing work, which is to conduct community workshops that allow uh, community members, stakeholders to discuss and negotiate the trade-off. And finally, I'm going to talk about some of our vision and maybe some uh, like a big picture and long-term goals. So first, I'm going to briefly talk about the interview study. So uh, we interviewed 16 uh, participants and um, they include the ORUS creator, Aaron Hafaker, and the two, de two, two developers, and four um, Wikimedia product team members, and seven editors, and two uh, researchers who do research related to Wikipedia. 
And in this interview, we ask questions like, yeah, what is your role on Wikipedia? And what is your experience? related to our are you using our system are you affected by our system are you building tools to rely on the outputs of our system etc and we also ask questions about their opinions and ideas for the future and we analyze the interview results using the ground theorem approach and we coded every line of the inter uh, interview transcripts and conducted the immersive group meetings to cluster codes and discuss and iterate on the themes as a result, two creator values and five convergent community values uh, emerged from the results of the interview. So now I'm just going to very briefly talk about this uh, interview, uh, sorry, these values, these uh, convergent community values. And for the full list of results, you can go back, ref, uh, refer to our paper. So we identify five community values with, uh, with regard to the machine learning based system that are used in the community. So the first one is effort uh, reduction. And second is a human authority. Third one is workflow support. First one is a positive engagement, and last but not least, the community trust. So in today's presentation, I'm going to like highlighting these two value. And the reason that I'm going to highlighting is later I'm going to show actually there are tensions and conflicts uh, uh, between these two values. So first about uh, effort reduction. And our participants told us that they told us repeatedly that it is important for these machine learning based systems, especially these quality predictive systems, to help reduce the effort of community maintainers. So, for example, one of the interviewee told us that if we can leverage the manpower that we do have with more automation, these people will have less backlog and can focus on other contributions. And also uh, people have been told, uh, to, uh, telling us that the positive engagement is another really important community va value that the, these machine learning based systems should follow. So specifically we want to encourage the positive engagement with diverse editor groups. So one of the participant interview participants told us that I think that article quality is driven to a large extent by the diversity of hundreds of users. Another interviewee like pointed out that the current ecosystem of Wikipedia limits the diversity of the contributors. So the ecosystem needs to change in order to be more welcoming to certain kinds of people. So now with these two values, and when we dig deeper and see how we can map these values into the actual system criteria and design of these ORS tools and applications based on the ORS, and we realize that actually there are sometimes inherent trade-offs between these uh, uh, when we're trying to implement these values. For example, in order to reduce the effort, a community like a maintainer's effort, we have to improve and uh, try to achieve the highest possible overall action accuracy. And also we might want to uh, have low false negatives, which means that we want to catch all, all the possible damaging edits. However, on the other hand, if we want to have like positive engagement with diverse edit groups, the first thing we need to do is probably have a low false positive, which means that we don't want to falsely label any good edits. And also we want to have low disparity between model performance on different editor groups, for example, anonymous editors, newcomer editors, and experienced editor groups. And actually right now the ORS model has actually a huge disparity between different editor groups. So, uh, in the second study, or what we do is like we're trying to create a virilization system that can capture and explain the trade-offs between these different community values. So uh, we create this uh, virilization system called Aris Explorer. It is a set of virilizations to help application designers and community members to understand the inherent trade-off in the Wikipedia aura system. Uh, we follow the best practice in the design of virilization, the iterative design process, start with the initial research, ideation, design, prototype, uh, user testing, informal testing, and refinement. 
So now I'm going to show uh, what this visualization looks like. So first, uh, the visualization start with this uh, landing page, uh, which in this page, we provide a basic overview of the ORUS prediction models and how this ORUS scores, uh, scores the edits and how the ORUS actually make predictions according to uh, the thresholds. And uh, maybe you can see from this uh, screenshot, we also use some simple diagrams that to help users to understand the machine learning concepts and metrics in the context of Wikipedia and ORUS. And in this way, the users can have the necessary knowledge to explore the realization that comes uh, next step. And the next step is uh, uh, we have this threshold explorer so the threshold setting actually uh, determines the predictions and also determines like especially the trade-off between false positive and false negatives. So for example, if the threshold is set to 0.5, any edits with scores above 0.5 will be predicted as damaging. The explorer will allow users to play with the threshold setting and visualize the threshold, uh, uh, visualize how the threshold will have a different impact on different metrics and, uh, and uh, what, uh, we also explain the impact uh, like using the language that Wikipedia editors can understand. And in addition, we create this like group disparity visualizers, which allows uh, users to see and compare the model's perf uh, performance on different groups uh, in terms of accuracy, false positive rate, false negative rate, et cetera. We also have this threshold recommender interface. And in this interface, we um, actually directly recommend the threshold to the users according to their preferences and their goals. So if, for example, if they want to create a automatic a agents to automatically revert the edits, and then we recommend a threshold, but the threshold is different compared to the uh, another design task, for example, creating a human reviewing like tools that have have people uh, direct people's attention to most possible like damaging edits. So uh, in order to evaluate uh, this visualization uh, system, uh, we recruited 10 participants and five participants are from uh, our Wikipedia community members and they are uh, editors and some of them are developers of the tools. And one of them I remember is a Huggle application designer. And we also um, included five participants who are outside the Wikipedia community. So we want to see if there is any difference between the Wikipedia members and non-Wikipedia members when they interact with the uh, uh, visualization system. And um, uh, here I'm just going to give a very brief overview of the highlights of the results of the evaluation. What we found is that first, this uh, ORUS Explorer, our visualization, improves participants' understanding of the trade-offs um, in setting different ORUS model thresholds and the associated impact on the community members. And it, interestingly, we found that both the uh, Wikipedia members and non-members who are people who are outside Wikipedia can understand the trade-off after, uh, after playing with the uh, uh, visualization system. And second thing is like what we found quite interestingly, although the group disparity visualizer helped surface ORS models for performance disparity in different other groups, However, most participants uh, accept the disparity as a natural occurrence and were not really concerned about the fairness implications in the system. So uh, the second study talks about yeah, how we create the visualizations to like make the trade-off more like interpretable to people. And the third study, which is the current ongoing work, we're trying to open this up to a broader community members. And currently we are trying to conducting community workshops that allow uh, community members, stakeholders to discuss and negotiate the trade-offs. 
The goal is that we want to combine this realization system and the community deliberation workshops to explain the tensions uh, to the community members and resolve the tensions, the trade-offs between the commu different community goals in the R system. So we are currently running the workshop in both Dutch community and English community. So this is the uh, deliberation protocol we are uh, currently designing and using. So uh, it has the, the protocol has four steps. So first, each participant will individually complete a pre-survey to uh, I, I get an understanding of their like uh, knowledge about ours, their experience and roles in the Wikipedia community. The second step is that they are going to individually explore the ORS Explorer interface. And uh, we also, uh, uh, based on the, uh, uh, we also have this interface for creating a model card so they can select a particular um, like threshold and then uh, create a model card, which I'm going to show uh, in the next slides. So, uh, and then uh, they, you, you, people can use this model card for the, uh, in the third step, which is a group discussion. In the group discussion, people are going to share the model card, the model they pick. And then they are going to discuss the pros and cons and then uh, collectively write a proposal. And in the last step, they are going to, uh, we, uh, we ask people to complete a post survey and to see yeah, how people's perceptions might change like after the deliberation process. So as I mentioned, so we are going uh, the, the, or the participants, they are going to use this explorer to understand the trade-off. And we create this uh, new functions on the realization uh, interface that people can pick a, a threshold and uh, generate a model card. And they can also uh, provide their explanations on like why they want to choose this particular model. And when people are during the group discussion and people are, this is the instruction we provide to the workshop participants and they are going to discuss which model they think is producing the best outcomes and we recommend for the community to use. And during the discussion, we also encourage them to discuss people's definitions of good outcomes in Wikipedia, pros and cons of different models. And if they are developing a model of uh, English or Dutch wiki, which one like we hope that the group can discuss and reach consensus on like uh, which model uh, the group collectively recommend. And during the whole discussion process, people can always go back to the Explorer uh, interface and then like a uh, pick new model or like uh, actually uh, get access to look at the model they previously selected. And as the outcome of the workshop, we want people to create a group proposal. So if they agree on selecting model, they can write down their uh, rationale for picking the model. If they are not able to agree upon a model, we also want people to share their reasons. And at the end of the proposal, we also want our participants to provide uh, uh, like some high level principles or values that the ORS developers or any future AI system builders that Wiki should consider to better benefits uh, like the uh, either the English Wikipedia or Dutch community. So by the way, yeah, we are currently actively recruiting participants to participate in our uh, community workshops, these deliberation workshops. So if you're, uh, you yourself is interested in participating in the study, please email me if you know someone who might be interested in participating, also feel free to email me and all forward uh, maybe my email or send my email to uh, the people you know might be interested. So uh, that is uh, um, so a quick overview of these three projects. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions you might have and have some deeper discussion. Uh, so before we move on to the question, I just want to briefly talk about some of the maybe uh, big picture or high level or like long term goals. So. Um, uh, as Google's AI team states, artificial intelligence can provide new ways of approaching problems and meaningfully improve people's lives. 
However, the challenge is that how to ensure that the AI technologies once introduced into the complicated social context introduce the community can actually achieve the desired outcome and how we can actually apply AI to actually address a community's problems. So uh, my research trying to uh, tackle this issue. So the approaches we use is like we work closely with multiple online and offline communities and try to use this uh, human center and community centered approaches and trying to solve people's problems, communities' problems. And we also want to reflect on and the position, uh, like reflect on our experience and the position our insight into the broader maybe uh, literature and and other practice that people have been using. In, uh, and uh, the goal is that we want to create a framework for the community-centered AI design or community-centered AI governance. And the idea is like in the long run, we want to generate a set of best practices, methods, metrics, and create and publish a set of resources as a component of framework to support replications in the community-centered AI work. So uh, I want to thank all the participants who participated in our studies, our interview study, our formal informal evaluation of our realization and our uh, community workshops. I also want to thank our collaborator, Aaron Hafaker, Ronald, CEO uh, from Dutch Wikipedia community and my students, collaborators. And um, I look forward to yeah uh, discuss with all of you and feel, uh, and if you have any question, also feel free to email me uh, after the talk. Thank you. Thank you for this nice presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, so perfect, we're perfect on time. I think we have ample of time, enough time for questions. Um, um, I see. At the moment, there's nothing in the in the chat. So, if but if you have a question, please put it please put it in the chat. Um, if we have someone here in the room, please go ahead. Then okay. just unmute yourself. Yeah. First, thank you very much for this talk. It was impressive. It's so inspiring this work, uh, and I, I truly mean it. So I have so a question. So my, my first one, and then I will turn to uh, leave a space for others. But the first one will be like, I really love that approach on how to build tools to help designers and users to select algorithms. Uh, I've always been like in, in my research, like very interested in how to build system or dashboards that allow users to explore uh, some complexity and then to understand pros, contracts, uh, how decisions, uh, the implications of when decisions are taken. Uh, so I, I found very relevant that you're using this to understand how algorithms uh, perform. But I see some challenges there. So usually in my experience, like many times, the users who finally use this, uh, exploit these dashboards are the ones with high level of digital uh, literacy. Right. It are not the ones that you are addressing for trying to inform them. So how do you combine that trade-off? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. So first of all, yes, I think um, uh, literacy, like uh, algorithm literacy or machine learning literacy is definitely a very uh, like um, important barriers for a lot of this like community-centered uh, AI work or AI design or AI governance. So, um, that's one of the reasons that we create this virilization system so that we follow the best practices in like HCI and designing this interface. So we try to test actually the participants we test, uh, or we recruited in participating in our evaluation. So uh, they do not have a lot of uh, machine learning knowledge. They're actually not a machine learning experts. What we found is like by actually contact 
uh, contextualize this machine learning model in the domain that people are familiar with or in the domain that they are actually, uh, for example, Wikipedia, they know like, oh, if these are edits, they want to predict uh, damaging or not damaging. So we're trying to uh, contextualize all these machine learning uh, metrics and concepts in the domains and use visualization that as a way that we can, pe people can have this tangible, actually uh, like uh, look at these tangible consequences of having different threshold. The goal is to make sure that people do not need to have a lot of machine learning knowledge can still participate uh, in these conversations and discussions. So uh, that's a goal. And I think like we, uh, or I think uh, to some extent we have like a uh, like the sort of uh, achieve some of this goal. But what we're talking about is another important uh, issue, which is like uh, people's like motivations in participating in all these activities and discussions. So uh, actually the people who are maybe a lot of people who are eventually affected by these systems, for example, um, uh, anonymous editors or uh, newcomers. And actually currently our uh, system, I would say that are not that accurate in predicting uh, like uh, the edits made by anonymous editors and um, um, uh, anonymous editors and the newcomers actually they uh, a lot of the good edits produced by these two groups of editors are actually uh, falsely labeled as damaging so they are actually uh, affected the most by these systems but they are not necessarily uh, maybe uh, have the channel or like are, will, are willing to participate in uh, in these deliberation activities or like in these workshops. So how we can ensure that we engage the uh, people who are most affected by the systems in the discussion, I think that we still need to work hard on that. So in the current deliberation workshop, we're trying to reach out to anonymous editors and newcomers, but we haven't yet <laughs> yeah, uh, do a very good job at that. But if people have any suggestions yeah please yeah um yeah let us know i look forward to maybe more conversation about how we can like engage more diverse uh like editors in the uh in these conversations and activities thank you i hear there's a follow-up question to that or related question at least in the chat isaac could you pass it on yeah, from uh, Samuel on YouTube, we've got a, a nice related question, which is, um, they say, thanks for the great work and inspiring presentation. Is there any explanation behind the choice of Dutch and English Wikipedia communities? And will future research cover other communities as well? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. So, so the reason that we actually started this workshop uh, in the Dutch community and the uh, Wikipedia community, uh, English uh, community for two reasons. So first it's like uh, Dutch community, uh, I think, uh, yeah, we want to find like a smaller wiki and a larger wiki. I think oh, based on some of the historical analysis uh, um, on the use of ours, we found that the patterns people use like our system in recent change actually in interface it's very different in the smaller wiki and the uh, and larger wiki like uh, like english so that's why we trying to not just look at english wiki but also uh, identify smaller wiki um, and they have their own concerns about using our system so we want to uh, hear that and another reason is actually uh, Aaron our uh, close collaborator and uh, he contact uh, he get us connected to great uh, two great uh, Dutch uh, community members, uh, Ron and Sealed. They have been providing a lot of help in terms of like translating some of our interface instructions, and we greatly help in terms of facilitating the workshop. So we often sometimes when we are running this like community center the workshop activities, we we need a lot a lot of help from the insider of 
the Wikipedia community, then we got the connections with the Dutch communities. So here again, I want to call out and really thank Ronald and the CEO in, the, uh, in their help for their help. So yeah, and I think we are we are definitely interested uh, in expanding these workshops to other language versions. So if you happen to know or you uh, like uh, people who might be interested in like actually working with us in, there are a lot of barriers for example language is still one barrier so we we currently actually have uh, all the oris models on uh, three uh, 38 different languages and then we we uh, yeah we can actually feed our interface we are using interface with all these 38 different models but still the interface currently is in english and we have a dutch version if we are like running in another language version we have to translate everything to the language so we need help a lot of help and also getting connected to the actual members of the uh, communities and having our ways to recruit participants in the community so yeah we not uh, we will need a lot of help but if you will you yourself or know someone who might be interested in helping please let us know thank you thanks and i, I think you already kind of answered a follow-on question i had but i'm i'll in, ask it anyway which is um like how much variation do we see between language communities? And you're, I think you said essentially that it's less maybe the cultural differences between languages and more the size of the wiki that seems to be the factor, but. Right, right, right. So we are currently running some analysis um, by looking at the historical uh, data, looking at how the different maybe edits once they are flagged uh, by the R system, the likelihood that they are actually getting reverted and comparing different language versions. What we found is like actually smaller wikis, they tend to use uh, a less sensitive threshold. And also they are in general use ORS less. I I guess one of the reason is like the just the sheer volume of the uh, incoming edits are not that big enough. So it's like ours or so this kind of quality prediction system maybe plays the less important roles in reviewing the edits. However, in a larger wiki like English Wikipedia, ours definitely yeah play an important role, help direct the editor's attention to the most like uh, most like uh, damaging maybe uh, the edits that are most likely to be damaging. So I uh, actually larger Wikipedia's like to use the system more, a uh, user ORS and the re related or ORS related tools more often. But we also think there are other like a uh, cultural uh, like uh, factors influence the use and also the governance of these uh, like uh, ORS systems. And um, yeah, we would love to explore more. So I think currently we only have some intuitions, but yeah, yeah, I think that's a very interesting topic. I'm personally very interested to see how the, dif uh, the, the, the difference between different language versions. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question. Um, anyone in the room who would? I do. Okay, so here's a second question. So another thing that I really like from your talk is how you transition to this uh, human-centered artificial intelligence to community-centered artificial intelligence and machine learning. Like, I really believe that there is not a just one human truth. So I think it's very relevant how you bring that collective dimension and how you bring that deliberation among communities to decide and uh, co-decide with uh, the process that they want. But still, I feel that communities cannot be, in the same way that uh, an individual cannot be isolated from the community, the community cannot be isolated from the ecosystem. So at, in this moment, uh, we are living in an era that we have some evidence that we are, uh, there is a climate crisis, uh, climate crisis that is, is, is happening. Uh, so I'm wondering if you're considering environmental factors in this process of decision making and governance of machine learning, in the same way that there has been this discussion with the famous paper about the stochastic patterns and so on. So how to bring this impact of into the environment of machine learning to the community's discussions? So, uh... 
when you mean like impact of the environment, you mean like the community culture, or do you mean like uh, um, yeah, what specific maybe the culture you mean, aspect of the culture? You mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like <clears throat> in the same way that they can decide uh, around the trade-offs of, of mm -hmm. those algorithms, also what uh, there's other impact, and not uh, not only in terms of the algorithms. Uh, to solve the problem, but how many resources need that algorithm to, mm -hmm. to succeed? And what is the impact of that in terms of the environmental uh, effect? So I, I'm wondering if this is some dimension that you would like to include in the discussion with the communities. Yeah, that's very interesting. So um, the, yeah, and I think it's, uh, um, we, we different things like when you are trying to like design and deploy AI systems in a, uh, in a complicated community environment and the setting. So there is a, a lot of factors that have to be considered. So actually like the uh, budget and it's different uh, like resources. And uh, here we talk about the yeah, trade-off uh, between like uh, between different specific goals that like the uh, the system machine learning systems should uh, trying to achieve and uh, Isaac and I uh, had another discussion about privacy so and how how they're uh, how, uh, releasing the Wikipedia data and then actually have yeah the, um, what kind of the use of the data have a different privacy kind of concerns implications so yeah it's a very uh, so I think the, the, you are right so one of the really unique thing about like designing for community is different from designing for individual user is just the complexity. So in co complexity in terms of the different uh, multiple goals that you might want to like trying to achieve and trying to balance, there is different multiple opinions between different group, uh, different community members and inside the group, uh, inside the larger community. So in Wikipedia, we have editors group, uh, editor also have different kinds of editors. We have reader groups. And then we also may have like, um, uh, yeah, all the maybe people who are developing tools for the Wikipedia community. So all these different like uh, subgroups in the community, they are like a uh, different goals. And then all these different constraints that uh, either the budget resources, uh, like the uh, or time zone, yeah. Um, all of these like actually just makes a, a, a why like a community center, I would say like community center, AI uh, design or community centered like uh, uh, technology design is very different and also uh, uh, challenging. So uh, our approach is like we're trying to first identify the most important goals that we want to achieve for a given like community context and then trying to quantify the trade-off and visualize the trade-off between the most important goals and then engaging communities like in the deliberation, discussion, negotiation negotiation, the balancing of the of the trade-offs between most important goals. Maybe in other problems like the budget is the most one of the most important constraints. But in some cases the privacy becomes really important. So identify the most important goals and then trying to figure out the trade-off and then getting uh, acceptable like solutions that like uh, work for the uh, uh, community, but also make sure that we getting like diverse groups in the dis uh, engaging the discussion and the decision making process. I feel like that's very, uh, yeah, that's approaches we might want to use. And also this is uh, maybe uh, in, order to, in order to like uh, achieve more desired outcomes for the whole community. Great, I think this is a good time to, to switch to the other presentation. Thank you again, Hai, Thank for you. this talk. Um, Andy, you're still around. I think we can. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Let me get my slides up. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, can everyone see my screen okay? Looks good. Awesome. 
Uh, so yeah, thank you for setting this up, Martin and uh, Hai. That was really excellent. Uh, the the Ores Explorer is fascinating. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so anyways, hi everyone. My name is Andy Craze. I'm a senior software engineer on the machine learning team here at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I've been here for a couple of years now. My work's kind of taken taken all sorts of places, but uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of stuff around the peripheral tooling, around the ORS system, um, trained some models, done some other stuff around that. And currently, uh, our team is hard at work on upgrading the infrastructure for uh, supporting the modern machine learning workflow here at the foundation. And I'm here to talk to you all today about kind of our first steps and kind of the initial conversations that we're having in figuring out how do we have like a or like a machine learning model governance uh, framework or policy in place that supports, you know, our commitment to free and open knowledge and also, uh, you know, is an inclusive space both to the community that may or may not be, you know, technical or experts in this field and also uh, support our staff here in uh, doing our work uh, in the different contexts that we do here. So I guess just at a high level, I just wanted to kind of cover what I want to talk about here. Um, We'll start with some background information, kind of how we arrived on this uh, <laughs> on this concept. Um, we'll talk about some related work and research projects here at the foundation that are in this space. Uh, there's also some high level governance considerations that you know we're seeing uh, pop up time and time again. Uh, and, you know, we've got some ideas on what we can do for that. Next, we'll talk about how we can embed uh, these considerations and our values for these considerations within our path to production. Um, and then lastly, we'll just kind of wrap things up with next steps and where we want to go with all of this. So yeah, uh, let's get into it. Uh, machine learning model governance, what is it? Um, so when I think of like a model governance policy, I think of the actual management of our models that we present in production and host and kind of published to the world. Um, and we have a number of different types of models that we do that with right now. You know, so we have community developed models that we host on our infrastructure. We also have internal models that are developed by staff here at the Wikimedia Foundation. And then there's also hybrid models that are, you know, built with the community and kind of are, you know, continuous collaborations. We also think about, you know, how do we implement policies related to the model life cycle? You know, do models die? Do they become irrelevant? Um, what does that look like? Uh, also, you know, we look at policies related to harm reduction and if something is harmful or there is, you know, a bunch of bias, how can we remediate that? And also maintenance, this is something that comes up often is, you know, what happens if a legacy model has some serious issues? Is it worthwhile to fix? Should we make a new model? Uh, you know, how do we handle that? And then also uh, compliance for data privacy laws. This is something that I think, you know, everyone's starting to think more and more about, and I don't think it's going away anytime soon. There's the big ones, you know, there's GDPR, CCPA, et cetera. Um, how do we maintain compliance in a global context when we're hosting all sorts of different types of models for all sorts of different types of tasks? Um, so I guess, why are we talking about this? Uh, so we've been, I feel like this just keeps coming up in different conversations within the team. Um, but the general consensus I keep seeing, you know, both here at the foundation and in industry is that, you know, we're past that applied machine learning is not valuable. Uh, there's all sorts of tasks, all sorts of, you know, problems that you can use it as a tool, but that's just, it. I think, you know, machine learning is a tool. It's not a solution. It's something that should be used in conjunction or in conjunction with uh, other methods to arrive at a conclusion to the problem that you're trying to solve. So I think, you know, moving away from the hype peak uh, and kind of instead shifting our focus on how do we build responsible systems? Um, you know, I think we've already trudged through the trial of disillusionment and kind of where we are on this this uh, this curve is we're starting to crawl up the slope of enlightenment and we're like, you know, how do we do this in a responsible way and in a way that keeps going without any of us, you know? Um, and I think there's two quotes that kind of illustrate this a bit more. Uh, I recently reread Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. If you haven't read it, I would recommend it. Uh, it kind of talks about the dangers of, you know, predictive systems, big data, all that stuff. But 
Uh, Kathy O'Neill says something along the lines of, you know, algorithms or algorithmic systems are just opinions embedded in code. So how do we make sure that these opinions are fair and support our work and our values here at the foundation? And then there's also the famous quote by the statistician George Box, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And I think that that's, uh, that is <laughs> what I've seen in practice. Like there's, you know, all these models are essentially just opinions, but you know, sometimes these opinions are helpful. Uh, and how do we arrive at a consensus that these opinions are helpful and useful to our communities and our work here at the foundation? So, uh, I guess that's a long winded way of saying, you know, the machine learning team wants to understand our ethical responsibilities around fairness, accountability, transparency, all that good stuff. We also want to understand our legal responsibilities, you know, for data privacy laws, remediation. Uh, there's a lot there and a lot of things that are changing in that space. So how do we stay on top of it? How do we respond? But I think ultimately we want to embed our values into the governance process. So there is governance with our models right now, but a lot of it we keep hearing from, you know, contributors and people here at the foundation is that it's implicit. So we are wanting to make a lot of this implicit <laughs> governance into explicit policy. And I think the big thing right now that we're discussing is how do we balance short-term gain versus long-term value? And I'll just say like, as an engineer, it can be really frustrating when you're told you got to go slower and, you know, you got to like check all these things off. But, you know, at the end of the day, when you have like a polished and safe and responsible system, I think that that really pays off on, you know, whatever frustration you might be when you, you can't go fast. So, um, yeah, move slow and don't break anything, I think is kind of what we're looking at on this. But so anyways, as I mentioned, uh, we are currently hard at work upgrading our infrastructure here to support the modern machine learning development cycle. So at a high level, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, it's a continuous training loop. Basically, we're taking raw data from a website, putting it into our data lake or our data architecture here. And we kind of get it ready, cleaned up for doing uh, machine learning tasks with it. We train models, we compare those models, and then we uh, deploy them and serve them to the world. So kind of the component we're working on right now is the serving component, uh, you know, uh, how do we host our models? So for those of you who work in this space or have, have done this, uh, yeah, serving a machine learning model into production is non-trivial. Um, you know, actually, yeah, let's back up. The it's, you can totally put a machine learning model behind an API and call it done. But, you know, once you start trying to scale, once you start having like, you know, any sort of traffic, there's all these other concerns that start popping out and arising and you start to spend your time on, you know, a lot of things that are not machine learning. Um, and so this image comes from a paper called The Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems. Uh, it was written by some Googlers back in 2015. And I feel like this is a very accurate representation of how putting a machine learning model in uh, a production system usually goes. So that little uh, black square there, that's about the size of like the actual machine learning or AI code that you're gonna be doing. And then you spend probably the rest of all your time addressing all these concerns. And so this was back in 2015 when a lot of this was uh, identified. But now in like 2021, if we're gonna do this responsibly and you know, in a global context, there are a number of other considerations that kind of arise that we also need to start thinking about. And uh, you know, we'll touch on these in just a sec, but before we do that, I just wanted to talk about some related work that's already gone on here at the Wikimedia Foundation that's uh, you know, in this space. So first and foremost, uh, Jonathan Morgan in 2019 made some very interesting proposals related to ethical and human-centered AI for part of the Wikimedia Research uh, 2030 program. Also, there is the ORS uh, paper, Lowering Barriers with Participatory Machine Learning in Wikipedia, and that was written by, by Halfacre and Geiger. Uh, yeah, let's talk about these real quick here. So, as I mentioned, there were some interesting proposals made by Jonathan Morgan on the ethical and human-centered AI work. Um, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. Um, I'm just going to cover one little bit here that I thought was really useful and pertain to what we're talking about, uh, specifically on checklists. So there's a quote here from a paper on the checklist where it says something to the effect of checklists connect principle to practice. And 
that is kind of what we're looking for. Um, you know, making the implicit explicit. It's one thing to have values, but it's another thing to embed those values into your day-to-day -day work. And I think, you know, when you have to go through and check a box before you get something out there, it makes you kind of think like, oh, you know, am I doing this the right way? Or am I upholding our commitments to such and such values? So I really like this idea of checklists and it kind of, it kind of builds off of what we were thinking about uh, to start, you know, our first steps with the governance policy. Now, with ORS, um, I already talked quite a bit about ORS, and I think there's there's a lot to say about ORS. Um, it's a, I feel like yeah, it started like six, seven years ago, and it's it's a big project. And I think what's really, really unique about ORS is the fact that it is a community-based machine learning uh, project. And as far as I know, there's nothing quite like it out there in the world. And kind of the way it worked is, uh, you know, the scoring platform team, which is what my team, the machine learning team, used to be called, uh, the whole process was shepherded by the scoring platform team. When essentially like a wiki community would come to us, like let's say, I don't know, French Wikipedia is having a problem with vandalism. So we would start off with a period of community consultation where we talk about the technical feasibility, you know, do we think we can help you? You know, we kind of talk about, how the, the process goes and you know expectations, things like that. And then the next step is a community data labeling campaign. And this is done with an in-house tool called Wikilabels. Um, I don't know if many of you have seen it, but if you have not done a data labeling campaign, it is tedious, it's, it's difficult. Um, <laughs> I can't make it through a couple more, like a couple more than like 10, uh, 10 labels without just like wanting to hang it up. Um, and especially, I mean, you're looking at diffs inside of MediaWiki and you're labeling them. And, you know, this this becomes a bottleneck sometimes, uh, but we have to have the community involved because we want to do this in their language. So oftentimes what we see is, you know, there'll be a very motivated crew at the beginning and then towards the end of the campaign, it's just one person and they're, you know, <laughs> grinding out the last like five, 6,000 labels. It's it's a serious bottleneck and it's a, it's a hard problem. Um, but once we finish those campaigns, then we move on to feature selection. And this is where we pick out our signal or things that we think will give us a better signal for our models to make a prediction. And this is usually done in conjunction with the Wiki community. So like in the case of like vandalism, we would ask them for a list of bad words that might help us pick up on a signal on, you know, if something's vandalism or not. After we do that, then the, the scoring platform team or the machine learning team goes, builds a model, evaluates it, has the wiki community in the loop if they're happy with everything and we're happy with everything then yeah we deploy it to production and it becomes a part of ORS. so it doesn't always work like this but this is the gold standard this is kind of like you know how we do community-based machine learning here at the wikimedia foundation and um you know a difficulty is how do we scale it there's all these different you know multilingual communities everyone's a volunteer, you know, uh, you know, how, how do we keep track of things? And the way that we did this with ORS is the ORS support checklist. And essentially this is kind of like a public registry that is, um, it's a static website hosted on uh, Toolforge here at the foundation. And essentially it just gives you a list of the wikis where they're at in the labeling campaign, lets you know if a model's available or, you know, kind of just the status on that. But I think as of right now, there's 110 models into production. Uh, like I said, you know, this project's been going on for like six, seven years now. A lot of our local points of contact, you know, are either aren't involved or they've disappeared. And, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of the governance was implicit. And I think, you know, uh, we're a small team and things kind of <laughs> fall through the cracks sometimes. So how do we keep track of all of this information? And how do we make sure we keep the communities in the loop? Um, and I think that that's kind of why we are wanting to make an explicit policy to handle all of this and to also just kind of define a technical bar that uh, we hold ourselves to when we put these predictive systems out uh, into the world. So yeah, let's talk about our governance considerations. Uh, so I guess, what should a policy cover? Um, and in a lot of the literature and in, you know, the ethical and human-centered AI research and in ORS, 
a lot of this stuff keeps coming up. Um, so I bolded some of the, the more high level topics, I think for today, uh, in the interest of time, we'll just kind of skip the more technical stuff. Um, but yeah, let's, let's kind of talk about some of these real quick. So this is a big one, uh, reproducibility. Uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I think, you know, today in the era of Docker containers, cheap and plentiful VMs, Jupyter Notebook, all that stuff, there's really no reason that you can't, you know, deploy a model and also have like a reproducible container or image that you can hand out to the community or, or anyone who's interested. Um, I guess unless you're working on something super proprietary, but again, uh, you know, gold standard, like if you see a paper, you can go and look at the source code, download the image and you run it on your computer. Now there is the caveat about, you know, what about massive models that people can't run on their computers and things like that. And, you know, like, let's say you have a massive language model like BERT or GPT-2, GPT-3. Most of us aren't going to be able to run that, much less train it on our, you know, home computers and things like that. So something that's come up a couple of times, I think they talked about this at the most recent um, office hours. Uh, quick plug, if you haven't checked out the Wikimedia uh, machine learning team office hours uh, on Twitch, very, very interesting conversations. Um, but anyways, yeah, someone brought up the idea of like a reproducibility score. And, you know, what would that look like? You know, I think we'd want to take into account how easy it is to actually run on like a consumer laptop or, you know, efficiency or things like that. Um, but yeah, there are models that not everyone will be able to run, but I still do think that we should provide steps on running it just in case you have access to, you know, high performance cluster or something like that. But yeah, reproducibility, that's a big one. Another one we keep talking about is, you know, having an audit trail or documentation, uh, Documentation's hard. Uh, documentation <laughs> debt is real. Docs rot over time, and you know, it can be a full-time job just keeping docs up to date and things like that. One big win I think we had with ORs that we started doing maybe like a year or two ago was um, we started doing change logs for the software releases, and I think that that, I mean, maybe it's just helpful for me, but it's easy to forget why you had made like a technical decision or, you know, which experiments you ran and things like that. Um, just having those breadcrumbs available for someone reduces so much like, you know, cognitive overhead that like you can just go back in there and like, oh yeah, you know, six months ago, I remember we did this. Um, so yeah, I'd like to see more of that. Another thing uh, that was actually talked about earlier today um, and we'll talk about again is model cards. So if you're not familiar with model cards, um, the thing I really like about them is it's a living documentation. Like you're supposed to generate your model cards. It's not like, you know, this super bespoke, like handwritten notes or anything. Like it's something that you build each time you either like train or each time you deploy. And it's supposed to just, you know, expose the metadata for your model and also just kind of like answer some very basic questions. Uh, someone on the machine learning team, one of the SREs, Tobias, I believe, uh, said that he really liked the model cards because they they do a good job of balancing information density, right? And I think for us, that's a signal that this would create a more inclusive space for non-experts. You know, we don't want to hit you over the head with technical jargon, but at the same time, we don't really want to dumb it down to the point where like, you know, you're not getting the full story. So I think model cards are a um, a good way forward in that aspect. And then uh, the last thing there is document or data set documentation. So a big thing is like, you know, we document our software, we document, uh, you know, the overall projects, but I think the training data is just as important, right? You know, it's the a priori knowledge. It's, it's everything that the model's seen up to the prediction that you're asking for. So, you know, how do we document that? If we're not documenting it, are we, I mean, there, there's the possibility that we're perpetuating harm without recourse, right? So how do we document that? And there's a really interesting paper from, what was it, last year, that uh, kind of talks about maybe we should be looking at, you know, the library sciences or, you know, historical archive methods to uh, augment our data set documentation. So yeah, that's something we've been thinking about. Um, and how can we do that better? Uh, maybe a wiki article, I don't know. Um, but yeah, some food for thought there. 
Human in the loop sign off. So this is a big thing in software engineering. Uh, so every time I make a change to any of our code here at the Wikimedia Foundation, other people on the team have to approve it and say, yes, this is sane. I think this works, looks good to me. I think we should do something like that at another level for uh, machine learning models, especially when we're going from the sandbox to the World Wide Web. So what would that look like? Probably something similar to what we already do here, but I really want to include the non-technical perspectives, but then we start wondering like, how do we do this consistently then? And how do we, you know, not let this become another bottleneck? So definitely something we're talking about. Um, I'm going to skip over this one just in the interest of time, but essentially, yeah, we want to run some smoke tests just to make sure that the model software works. Um, pretty standard practice in software engineering. Um, I think we definitely want to keep doing that. Uh, Yes, okay, transparency and explainability. This is a big one. Uh, so one of our core values here at the Wikimedia Foundation is radical transparency. So I think we really need to be able to explain how our models work, or at least give a good faith explanation on how we think it works. Um, there's a lot I can say about like the whole subfield of XAI or explainable AI, but I mean, that's that could be its own topic. But yeah, so here's some salient bits about it. If interpretability, yeah, if interpretability is important, then we should be using models that are highly explainable, right? So tree-based models are about as simple as you can get when it comes with an explanation. Like um, you just kind of take the branches down and eventually you arrive at your regression value. Um, we can look at things like feature importance, provide counter examples or counterfactuals. There's also a lot of really great plug and play tools now for regression models, like, you know, Shapley values, Lime, et cetera. But then the question comes up, like, can we be transparent with opaque models? You know, things like neural nets, gradient boosted algorithms. I think we can, but it's, it's all about talking about that trade off, right? Like we chose a more opaque model due to its performance because this is critical in X, Y, and Z or something like that, you know, just, be transparent and provide a rationale for using an architecture and things like that. Um, and lastly, how do we make our explanations inclusive to non-experts? And this is kind of a hot topic, um, especially around like what types of explanations are helpful to people who aren't data scientists or who aren't you know machine learning engineers. And a question I see that comes up in a lot of the literature is you know are visual explanations helpful? Um, I think they're helpful for data scientists, but I'm not sure if they're helpful for people who do not have a background in this space. Um, so yeah, that's something we're kind of thinking a lot about. Like I said, there's some great tools uh, that are, you know, that work well with the containerized workflow for explainability. I think it's just a matter of integrating them with our, our current workflow. Uh, bias and harm testing, yeah. So this is one that I would like to see more of here at the foundation. You know, how can we avoid perpetuating harm? Uh, personally, one thing I would love to see is like a creation of some sort of like adversarial red team testing. Um, maybe it could be a community or a volunteer effort. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but either way, we need to create some baselines around, you know, protected class variables. Uh, and my guess too, and I think this was covered a little bit, is yeah, there's disparate in, uh Basically, there's, I'm sure that there is uh, marginalized identities that we are overlooking, and we just don't know even to look for that. So I think, yeah, we need to create a baseline. And then once we have a baseline on some of these different classes, how can we automate like our bias and fairness checking on many of these models? And even more so, like, I think that opens up an interesting idea. How do we define fairness in a global context? Like, you know, the way we might be looking at fairness here in the United States might be totally different than somewhere in say East Africa or something like that. So does a one size fits all approach make sense here? Or do we have the tools and the infrastructure to support like flexibility across cultures like that? Um, there's some open source tools we've been looking at, you know, there's general awareness tools like Lime. There's also some interesting debiasing and remediation tools. Uh, some of them are um, included and packaged with the AIF 360 library. It's a Python open source library um, for fairness and things like that. 
Um, and then, yeah, lastly there, I mentioned this before, detecting undocumented training data. Uh, data Sheets for Datasets is a great paper that kind of goes into some of those archival methods and ways that we can create a unified framework for documenting our data sets. Um, and I think that that will kind of fish out some of the uh, possible bias and harm that we might be perpetuating and that we're not even looking at. So um, yeah, would love to see more of this stuff in practice. Uh, I'm going to skip this again, production requirements and production monitoring. It's a little bit more technical, um, but at a high level, you know, we are building a platform that handles all of those things and does it inside of the containerized workflow. Um, last point I wanted to hit on here with these considerations is data quality and compliance. So all models degrade over time. Uh, you know, it's either the the framing of the problem eventually becomes irrelevant or new information comes to light that makes it like, you know, not a great solution. Or sometimes, uh, you know, the data becomes stale or invalid. So how do we detect model drift? How do we detect, um, you know, if the data is still valid or appropriate? Um, do we have guardrails and safety checks for, you know, sensitive data, things like PII? And then, you know, going further with that, with the legal compliance, uh, how do we like maintain compliance for all the different data privacy laws? So uh, the big one is GDPR. And a lot of model builders I know kind of view GDPR as like the de facto standard right now. I think it's probably the most fleshed out. It's probably been around the longest, uh, but don't quote me on that. But yeah, there's three really salient bits, I think, about GDPR compliance that pertain to model builders. First and foremost is the right to explanation. Uh, you know, I, I touched on this a little bit. If we're going to try and predict the future, we got to be able to tell people how we arrived at that conclusion. Um, it just, yeah, it's, I think, yeah, any sort of explanation or any sort of justification just, you know, increases trust with the users or communities ourselves. Um, also the right to be forgotten, uh, you know, especially in this continuous training loop that I've been talking about. If someone, you know, submits some training data or you contributes in one way or the other and decides they no longer want to be a part of uh, the project or something like that, we need to have a way to go in and fish that data out and you know forget about it. And we also need to have a way to prove that we did that. Also, we need to minimize the discriminatory effects. And I think, you know, in practice, yeah, like we don't want to do any of that. But <laughs> like we we don't want to discriminate. But in practice, it's really easy to. Uh, to perpetuate harm, even if that wasn't your intent. Uh, there's there's a lot of things that you know can happen once you put a model into production that you had no clue or didn't even intend for it to happen. So, you know, looking at those three things, how do we make sure that when we're retraining our models continuously and deploying them out to the world, uh, how do we make sure that we're compliant? So, yeah, switching gears just a little bit. So with all of those high level considerations, we want to take the processes outlined, uh, you know, in the previous research and projects here at the foundation. And we read those in our path to production. So I highlighted that section down there that says best model. Um, how do we choose what the best model is when we uh, put a model out into the world? Um, I think we do that by integrating our policy. You know, we embed our values into our machine learning process here at the foundation. So we put our principles into practice. I think the way I'm thinking about it and, you know, the way I think some other people here at the foundation are thinking about it is we need to have some way of embedding it and just like making sure that we don't try and get around, um, get around actually putting these into practice. So I think checklists are a great way to determine the model suitability. Um, it does come with the risk of rubber stamping saying like, oh yeah, we talked about it or, you know, but I still think that at least publishing this either on a wiki page or, you know, some static website that it allows other people to come in and, you know, help keep us honest. Also, like how do we keep track of all of the different types of models in production? I think the public registry approach with the ORIS support checklist is good. However, we should 
refine it such that it's generic and can handle, you know, staff models, models that are not ORs, models that, you know, are like computer vision or, you know, different types of things like that. And then you can kind of drill down and get into the nitty gritty, um, you know, with model cards or, you know, um, different reporting techniques. Also, I think the big thing is, is we want to do this in order to get more non-technical contributors involved. So yeah, continue to lower the barriers to participation, make an inclusive space for non-experts, newcomers, reduce that bus factor. Um, and I think kind of the easiest, most low hanging fruit is, you know, focus more on documentation, uh, data sets, model cards, all of that stuff. I think that can open up uh, additional types of roles and tasks in these projects that we aren't really looking at um, as engineers. So yeah, uh, this is kind of where we're thinking. So yeah, next steps, uh, just to kind of wrap this up, we would love to have people in the community and uh, staff here at the foundation to kind of just join in this conversation. We have kind of two initiatives right now. One is we're creating uh, a draft model deployment guideline for our new infrastructure. Uh, there's a fabricator task there. Uh, if you're interested, please subscribe to that. Hop in the conversation. Uh, tell us what you think. And also, yeah, uh, model cards, model reporting. Um, we are experimenting with uh, an approach with on wiki uh, automation for model cards. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in either of those two spaces, yeah, definitely jump in, subscribe to those, and um, yeah, kind of follow us on the adventure here. But uh, yeah, these are my references, and that is all. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andy. Uh, thanks for the great, great presentation. I'm sure there are some follow-up questions here. I, I give it to the room or to YouTube, if there's something. Sure, I can ask the question come in from YouTube. Um, the question is about, is from Thoward on YouTube, um, about how do we avoid perpetuating harm? Um, so I guess we need to be more specific, like uh, how do you know when harms are happening through these models and what are the kind of available actions that can be taken? Yeah, no, that that is an awesome question. And I think it's a question that we also still have uh, ourselves there. I'll just be transparent here. There's not a lot of work that's been done uh, internally on our production models in terms of like bias and harm testing. Uh, so I think in, the way I view it, we got to get some baselines first and foremost. Um, you know, I think we need to at least look, maybe start at all the protected classes and then kind of branch out that way. Um, I mentioned some open source tools that maybe we can start trying to detect it or, uh, you know, start trying to measure, um, you know, maybe some fairness metrics or, or things like that. Um, but yeah, it's that that's still an open question. And I would love to see more people spend more time uh, looking at that. Uh, so there are some kind of plug and play tools that we are exploring right now with our new infrastructure work. Um, it, so the one of them that we're looking at is called Selden uh, Alibi. And it's an explainability module. And there's also some fairness tools. Uh, but it treats your models as black boxes, right? So there's, I, I think this is good for getting a baseline, but once we have a baseline, I feel like more people <laughs> should dig in and kind of explore those different classes. Like, oh, well, why is, you know, this class uh, susceptible to bias on this type of model, but not these? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's still early days and I feel like that is a huge place for uh, improvement here, um, but it's also something that, yeah, is really important and uh, I would encourage anyone who's interested in it uh, to get in touch with us or, you know, uh, start digging into it independently. Yeah, I actually, if it's okay that I follow up uh, on the uh, discussion. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 
Yeah, so we are also trying to do some sort of like a fairness or like a, a bias detection on the ORS model. But actually, uh, Andy, you are exactly right. So one of the first challenges, like we just don't have the data on the predicted attributes, for example, of the editors. So for example, we know that female editors are on the representative of the whole Wikipedia editor populations, but we don't have the gender data of the uh, editors, or at least we only have maybe uh, some survey data, but we are not able to have like the maybe the gender or demographic information for all the editors. So it will be very hard for us, to, for example, to detect oh, yeah, whether the model are actually performing uh, similarly treating uh, like different uh, demographic groups uh, similarly or not. And the only like sort of protected attributes we have is sort of the uh, maybe uh, anonymous editor newcomers or experienced editors but somehow when we work with the stakeholders and communities sometimes they not necessarily think these are protected attributes to some extent i don't know so yeah this these are like really yeah interesting i think in terms of the yeah bias detections that is uh without the demographic information or these protected uh attributes or yeah first what are the protective attributes and then we don't have data on this and that will make it really hard to for some of the standardized, for, for them using any of the standardized tools to do the uh, auditing. Yeah, no, that you you definitely hit the nail on the head there. We, a lot of the editors, we don't really have that data and that's by design. You know, we, we wanna preserve people's privacy. Uh, you know, we're, it, it's not Facebook here. We're, we're not trying to get every single biometric. Uh, you know, we're not trying to build something, some crazy ad network and get a bunch of venture capital or anything like that. Uh, so yeah, that means that our starting point is a bit more obscured than other places. Like, you know, we don't know gender, don't really know age, don't know, um, you know, marital status, you know, all, all, all sorts of things that you would be able to get if you're working at, you know, a larger social media company or, or something like that. So yeah, it is a hard, it's, it's a hard thing to start. <laughs> so yeah, getting the, that initial baseline is really, it's like, you know, we got to solve that first before we can really start automating our bias and fairness checks. Any follow-up questions from the room here? Okay, yeah, I can take it. Uh, well, <clears throat> thank you, Andy, for this presentation today. It was very, very inspiring. There was one part at the beginning related to Ores that, <clears throat> that you presented all the different efforts by local communities in terms of labeling. So I'm wondering if there, is, if there is a framework for having both a local and a global labeling approach so that communities can benefit from labels created by other communities. Maybe this is something that is, uh, has been already explained, but I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, I, I think I see what you're saying. So yeah, I, I agree. Like, you know, is there a way for us to have like global, like, is there a way for us to have a global framework and then also a local framework? And like, how do we share power across, um, you know, the the process there? That, that's another hard question. Um, one thing I'd like to avoid is having different sets of rules for different, you know, groups, like, cause I feel like that would turn into, you know, rules for thee, but not for me or, you know, something like that. Um, I also don't want to like, you know, slow everything down with a bunch of additional bureaucracy but you know so so like i was saying uh with ors like if we're gonna make a bunch of changes with the ors models and if we're gonna keep all those communities in the loop how do we communicate all, all those changes to all those different communities do we go to their talk pages and like 
attempt to <laughs> talk to them in our in their own language. Like I only speak like two languages, almost three, but that, you know, I think if everyone on the team spoke three languages, that still would only be 12 languages. So like, I don't know, like, so that the scaling is hard, but I also am like, you know, I, I don't want to add a bunch of additional rules or set up like a bunch of additional meetings and things like that. Um, so it's, that's a hard question. I don't know the right way to do it. And I think that that's something that we're wanting to have like as an open conversation, like how do we do that? Uh, one thing that came up, we were talking with another team here. One thing that came up, one way we could handle that is like, you know, setting up like a committee, like maybe something like, you know, there used to be like a formerly like a, a research committee here that, that handled things uh, similar to that. Maybe like a machine learning governance committee where, you know, communities can send like a delegate or something like that. And we also have like staff appointed committee members, but yeah, no, that's a hard, it's a hard question. I don't, I don't have the answer for it, but it's something we are talking about. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know the answer for it yet, but definitely interested if other people have uh, ideas or input on it. Leah. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts on these last parts of the conversation. One is uh, perhaps this is something we should explore in more depth with uh, Andy and others, but the idea of regional hubs has been discussed and invested in extensively as part of the movement uh, strategy recommendations. So there's a lot of desire in general to redistribute power and decision making across the globe, which can happen for governance questions, which can happen in this context and in, in the context of machine learning. So that's kind of the first place that comes to my mind that we should explore. And I will say within the research team, as we think about expanding the uh, network of Wikimedia researchers globally, that's also a structure that we would like to figure out kind of how to tap into more and work more closely with the communities because scaling is always a problem uh, as we're thinking about how to go to more languages, more regions, how to be sustainable and not bring everything to Wikimedia Foundation, which at the end can become um, a single point of failure for many of these initiatives eventually. Um, the other thing on the question of um, how to do harm or bias assessment um, and it is true that we don't collect a lot of data, people don't share a lot of data with us. <clears throat> I'll, I'll say that we generally see a lot of generosity, at least by readers and in, in many occasions also through editors uh, where people opt in to share information with us, right? So I think this is not a, something we can do short term, but in the longer term, thinking about how to design systems that we can collect uh, potentially bio, um, demographic related uh, information from readers or editors in an opt-in basis um, in a way that is kind of compliant with our values and the kind of privacy assurances that we wanna have for the users. I think that's an option that I would love for us to explore um, and can help unknot some of the questions around uh, further debiasing the models or assessing potential harm. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely like where you're going with that. That I think the more people we can get involved, the more communities we can get involved with, you know, untangling the the bias and harm and and demographics is, uh, you know, I think we are going to find more identities that are being marginalized that we probably had no clue, and it's going to be probably uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, I think just as long as we hold space for that to be uncomfortable and just, you know, be transparent with our findings and things like that, uh, you know, and just make space for those conversations. I think that I kind of view it as a snowball. You know, the more we, we do it, the more people get involved, the more transparent we are, you know, the more people will trust us. And, you know, just our efforts on that kind of stuff will just keep getting bigger and bigger. And I think, you know, a lot of those issues will solve themselves further down the road. But, um, yeah, it's just getting it started and getting people involved in the conversation. Last chance for a final question. Otherwise I would wrap up.
then I think we also, it's a good, good moment to stop. We had a really long and interesting discussion. Uh, two great presentations. Thanks again, Angie and Hai. That was really amazing. Um, thanks to you. Thanks for everyone who joined to watch and participate in the discussion. Uh, thanks for Isaac for taking the questions and monitoring the channels. I also want to say thanks to Jana and Emerald who support us here to get the live stream going and for the admins setting this up. And I hope to see you in the next showcase in July and hope you have a good rest of the day. Bye.